Uh, hello everyone and welcome to our week three roundup uh, of, of this run of the MOOC. Um, I'm here at Southampton with Amy Westfield, who's one of my MA students uh, studying Jane Austen. Um, so it's a pleasure to have her with me to talk through some of your comments uh, in the last week. So this week we've been thinking about uh, adaptations and translations. Um, there have been some really interesting uh, comments um, and what I've done is to kind of highlight some of those um, and I think we'll just kind of talk through some of the issues that you've raised. Um, before we do that, I think one of the, the things to say is that um, people who've done the MOOC more than once uh, might have noticed that we've been a little bit less um, attentive in the last eight days or so. That's because we've been supporting industrial action um, across the country at universities. Um, so we missed you, but it's really nice to be back and to catch up with, um, with what you've been saying in our absence. So um, one of the first kind of things that um, some of you have raised uh, has been this difficulty in um, translating, um, first of all, Austen's uh, English into other languages that might not necessarily have the same uh, kind of range um, as English does, um, but also translating into different media too. So how do we take Austen's very distinct style, her use of free and direct discourse, um, and translate that into, uh, into films? Um, I think there's another kind of thing that we can raise uh, when we think about these issues, which is the question of how we translate Austen's historical moment into a moment that we can understand. Um, so she's using a lot of kind of references um, that a modern reader might not pick up on. Um, and this is something that, um, that has kind of run through uh, the course. So in a similar way to how um, if we said certain things about a character, if we said that a character was um, a Guardian reader or if we mentioned Fifty Shades of Grey, that would throw up an entire um, array of reference and meanings for a modern reader that perhaps other readers wouldn't pick up on. Austin does the same thing too. Um, one of the participants asked, uh, why are the militia in Meryton, for example? Um, and these are sort of small details that we might kind of skip over, but details that I think a reading that's really embedded in the history of Austen's moment um, can kind of uh, can can change our readings of. Um, and I think one of the things that's been really interesting this week is this tension between a, a desire to set Austen in her historical period and a desire to look specifically at her style. Um, these are two kind of critical schools. So there's the, there's the historicist school of criticism, which um, talks about the importance of looking at, at historical context. Um, and then there's something called new criticism, which is much more about looking at the formal elements of a text in isolation. So I think many of you will be able to place yourselves in distinct um, camps there. Um, one of the other things that I think has been really interesting um, and that came up a couple of times was questions about um, authenticity. Um, and this has sort of led us to think a little bit about piracies and plagiarisms, but also kind of irreverent practices um, in adapting Jane Austen. Um, one of the things that I wanted to draw attention to was that Austen herself is really well versed in doing this. Um, so we've, we looked at Northanger Abbey, for example, um, which parodies lots of Gothic texts. Um, and I think Austen has a kind of um, irreverent tone when she looks at some of these, these texts as well. I don't know if you want to, to talk a little bit about what, what, your, what your thoughts on reading Northanger Abbey were. Yeah, um, it's hilarious to start yeah. off with. And she's just kind of pulling all of these um, gothic texts that she herself thought were, you know, quite quite ridiculous in some mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. And it's something that she do, does in um, Love and Friendship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so she, she was always um, pulling things that she herself found very um, funny and like introducing it to an audience as a satirical play on what society thought was riveting. Um, what the fashionable people in the city were kind of reading. Yeah, and um, Isabella mm -hmm. is sort of like a, the embodiment of that. She's ve she's, she reads all these gothics and she's very frivolous and yeah, so mm. it's, yeah. But, but so, so even within the style of that though, Austen shows how she can take a particular genre um, and kind of use it. So she uses um, a, a technique that Anne Radcliffe used a lot in her own fiction of the kind of um, uh, the discovered um, reality behind something that appears to be supernatural. And this happens to, to Catherine, but this is something that Radcliffe also uses this kind of um, uh, uh, this technique. Um, of uncovering what's really kind of going on beneath something that appears to be um, supernatural. Um, but Austin also um, 
also kind of shows herself to be a really good um, writer of parody when she uh, uh, writes her juven juvenilia piece, The History of England, um, which is a kind of take on Oliver Goldsmith's four volume, um, four volume History of England, which was published um, in, in the 1770s. Um, so I think we can kind of think about Austen herself as able to approach um, seemingly kind of quite canonical or important texts with, with, um, with a sense of humour. And so I wonder whether that might change um, how we think about some of the adaptations um, of Austen. Um, there's been kind of outrage, um, and there is every time we do this actually, um, about um, the, the changes that are made to Austen, both in translations which change the endings of her novels, um, but also in adaptations um, which kind of take quite serious liberties, I think, um, uh, with Austen's texts. Um, none so much, I think, as uh, the recent adaptation of Sanditon, um, which has provoked outrage um, kind of on this MOOC, but also uh, kind of um, in, in the media as well. Um, so I, what was, you've seen Sanditon, right? Yeah, uh, what did yeah you, what I did, did you view it. it? Um, yeah, I thought it was, um, yeah, obviously very provocative. I think, the, I think the people who created it kind of knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you can, you can see how people were upset. I think um, everyone who reads Austen has sort of like a certain vision of Austen and what her novels should be. Mm -hmm. And I think it was very... Yeah, um, very provocative, and you could say that. But um, I liked it for what it was. Mm -hmm. um, the ending was obviously very um, unsatisfactory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the ending kind of flaunted yeah. what one would expect from an Austen ending, which is a tidy right. kind of uh, marriage mm -hmm. and a happy marriage for, for, for a sort of plucky heroine. Um, but I wonder, uh, I wonder, there seems to have been a sort of gut response that this was not an adaptation that was faithful to what would have been in Austen. Right. Um, and I think that's partly to do with the kind of inclusion of sex scenes, right? Um, yes, yeah, it was uh, very um, explicit, which I think is obviously not what we read into Austen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, I also saw a lot of comments about Austen wouldn't have had a character from the West Indies, mm -hmm. but I don't know if everyone knows this, but that character was actually there mm -hmm. in the foundation of the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think um, you could read that as Austen was perhaps maybe moving towards more politically radical, not radical to say, but sh her novels maybe would have, Become you know, more continued aware. to, yeah, mm -hmm. she did die quite young. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say that maybe given a shot, it mm -hmm. maybe, not as explicit as Sanditon, but you know, maybe they got a couple of the ideas right. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, Austen engaging with her modern moment in terms of writing Sanditon as a kind of, um, a text about the, the speculative economy and about um, the emergence of sort of seaside towns. Um, she is engaging with the kind of big questions of the day, right. just as Mansfield Park is dealing with questions about modernity, about slavery, persuasions mm -hmm. dealing with questions of the society, um, of the changing, um, the way that the Navy is impacting society and the changes that are coming about as a result of a new, a newly affluent kind of class of people, I guess. Um, so I suppose that kind of, it leads us on to um, the last point. I mean, the course is called um, Jane Austen Reality, Myth and Global Celebrity. And one of the things that we really want to do is to think about some of those myths about Jane Austen. Um, and one of those myths is that Jane Austen um, was kind of cloistered from the politics of the day or that she didn't really have anything to say about those. Um, the discussions that we try and open up about Mansfield Park and slavery are always um, really interesting discussions actually and, and really kind of involved um, and can be quite polarising too I think. Um, but I just want to kind of address that idea that Austen was writing in, in political isolation um, by sort of drawing attention to, to a few things that, that might suggest otherwise. Um, so the first is um, Austen's own family. Um, both of her, two of her brothers were in the Navy and so would have travelled um, widely. Um, and then Edward Austin uh, was made heir to um, the Chawton and Godmersham estates. And so he went off on a grand tour and also would have travelled widely. Um, Austin um, was exposed to kind of more cosmopolitan elements in her family as well. Um, 
yeah, her, her cousin Eliza, for example. Um, so I think there's, uh, and, and she is travelling in England, as, as one of the participants um, also pointed out. So she is kind of coming into contact with the world at large. It's not that she's just kind of cloistered away in Chawton, um, not engaging with things. Um, that said, I think she's not engaging in such an explicit way as some of her contemporaries. Um, I brought with me um, a poem uh, by Anna Letitia Barbald. Some of you have been talking about um, writers' engagement in the abolition cause. Um, and so I wanted to kind of give you an example of um, one writer who is really explicitly dealing um, with practices of slavery. So I'm just going to read the, the opening lines to this. Um, this was written, it's called An Epistle to William Wilberforce, um, and it was written um, as he petitioned Parliament to try and pass through a bill for the abolition of slavery, um, which failed. In, uh, so she writes it in 1791. And she says, Cease, Wilberforce, to urge thy generous aim. Thy country knows the sin and stands the shame. The preacher, poet, senator in vain has rattled in her sight the Negro's chain. With his deep groans assailed her startled ear and rent the veil that hid his constant tear. Um, so Barbold is really kind of trying to draw attention to a society that is ignoring um, the slave trade, that knows the sin and stands the shame, she says. Um, Austin is nowhere near as explicit as this, but I still think that Mansfield Park is definitely kind of raising um, the kind of spectre of slavery as something that's kind of feeding in yeah. um, to her society. So I don't know if you want to kind of say a bit about the names. Um, in, right, in uh, Park. yeah, well, Mansfield um, itself, they were um, figures, right, mm -hmm. in the sort of um, this conversation in um, the abolition of slavery. Mm -hmm. And I think it, they're both names that wouldn't have cropped up a lot they were they are definitely very pointed towards that conversation I think and I uh, that suggests obviously that Austin had you know a very political knowledge about um, yeah how her country was engaging with slavery mm. and what was going on really mm. And it comes back, I think, to, to what I was saying earlier about um, the way that Austin's using particular reference that would have meant something to readers at the time. Um, so I think the name Mansfield um, would have referenced Lord Mansfield, um, who uh, made a ruling uh, which kind of effectively and perhaps slightly accidentally made uh, slavery I uh, illegal on English soil. Right. Um, Norris was the name of a kind of famous um, pro-slavery campaigner. So I think, you know, it, it helps us in our characterisation of um, Mrs. Norris. Mm. Um, but also sort of thinking about it in a slightly more abstract way, um, Fanny is the person who is um, raising uh, the idea of slavery. You know, she's, she's showing those at Mansfield Park um, what kind of underpins their wealth um, and their prosperity and their comforts. Um, and, you know, they meet her with silence, of course. Um, but I, I just, yeah, I do think these are quite interesting kind of ways in which Austen is working her political moment into her novels. Um, someone who's written about this is Janine Bar Barkus, um, who um, has written a really interesting novel called... Uh, novel, a really interesting book called Matters of Fact in Jane Austen, where she thinks about Austen's use of names. Um, and I think that's... She makes some quite compelling arguments there. Um, and then the other thing I suppose to say about Austen um, writing politics is that she's writing about um, women's lives, which we're told by feminist critics that the personal is political. Um, and I think, you know, Austen writing about uh, uh, how women are kind of subjected to the marriage market is political. She's making political points. Um, so, I mean, I think you can see it in, um, if you think about Charlotte Lucas, for example, I know you picked that up in, in class quite a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, so her choice to marry Mr. Collins. Yeah, um, and I, th I think Austen as well, if you go through her novels, she's so conscious of what things cost, mm -hmm. what myth, or more like material culture. Mm -hmm. she's, she has so much knowledge about it. It's all very specific, especially in novels like Emma. All of the costs of things are really true to what they would have been, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I think... Great. You know, we have this tendency to see Austen's narratives as one that's ones that are timeless um, and that can be easily translated and easily adapted into um, things which we can relate to. But at the same time, I think they are um, tied to their specific moment, both in terms of the political backdrop, but also in terms of, um, yeah, 
the specifics that she is writing about, um, how much characters were worth. I think lots of you probably very much enjoyed um, engaging with um, uh, the kind of currency converter um, in week two. Um, so yeah, I think, I think there are these kind of divergent um, ideas about Austen's fiction. Um, one, that they're, they're, they're the product of um, the his her historical moment, and the other, that they are these kind of timeless things that we want to return to um, again and again. Um, so I hope that that's kind of uh, given you all something to, to sort of think about and to continue on the discussions. The message boards are going to be open for a few more weeks, so I do hope you'll go back um, and sort of think again about the, some of the material. Um, we uh, will be uh, engaging with you a little bit further over the next couple of days, um, but then we're going to leave you to it. So we'll close by saying thank you very much for joining us. We really hope that you'll fill out the exit survey at the end. Your feedback's really important to us um, in terms of how we can continue to develop um, this course. Um, and that's all from us. Cheerio, and we wish you a very Merry Christmas. <laughs>